He constantly wanted to compete with the Buddha. He kept wanting to pit his dramas against the Buddhas, and he always said that the Buddha could not compare with him. So Devadatta provoked King Ajatashatru into killing his father and mother, and then told Ajatashatru to become the new king, saying that he himself would become the new Buddha. That Chakumni Buddha was the old, decrepit Buddha. Devadatta wanted to overthrow the Buddha so he could become the new Buddha, but in the end he messed things up so badly that he fell alive into the hell. He just took his flesh body right along with him to hell. He was intent upon doing things differently from the Buddha, different from the way it is done in Buddhism. This is how. Externalist sectors are. You could also say that Devadatta was battling to be number one. He wanted to be first. He wanted this and wanted that, and in the end, his retribution was to fall into the hells. So it is useless to cultivate non-beneficial ascetic practices. The ancient said about eating meat, the pots of stew simmered. During hundreds of thousands of years, have brewed oceans of deep resentment into hatred that's hard to contain. If you want to know the reason for the disaster of weapons and troops, try listening at the door of a slaughterhouse to the haunting midnight cries. The pause of stew simmered during hundreds of thousands of years refers to the meat broth and meat soups. Which people have been cooking day in and day out for hundreds of millennia, the pots have brewed oceans of deep resentment into hatred that's hard to contain. Resentment as vast as the sea is contained in those pots of beef stew. Such hate and resentment cannot be smoothed over. If you want to know the reason for the disaster of weapons and troops in the past. On the hand, weapons were used in battle. It was not like the present, when rockets, bombs, and guns make it possible to strike from long range. Before, soldiers engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The way it is nowadays is much more vicious. If you want to know why there are wars in the world, try listening at the door of a slaughterhouse to the haunting midnight cries. Go to the slaughterhouse at night. Go to a place where cows, pigs, and sheep are killed, and listen to the sounds. What do you hear at midnight? At a slaughterhouse? Nowadays, slaughterhouses are usually located far away from populated areas, and so the sounds are not easy to hear. But we can think about it. People have killed so many living creatures, and as those creatures are reborn as people, they want. They will want to get revenge. That is why day by day, the resentment deepens. Day by day, the resentment grows. There is no way to resolve it. It has reached the point that the cycle doesn't even wait for those who have killed to die and become animals before the revenge is taken. People have simply taken the killing off their own kind. You kill me, and I kill you. You killed me in a past life, so now I'm going to kill you. The disaster of weapons and troops is based on killing and nothing else. That is why Buddhism explains that we must refrain from killing. Instead, we should liberate life and take the precepts. If one person refrains from killing, the world the world has much less violent energy in it, that much less evil influence. If ten people do not kill, then there are ten sources of auspicious energy in the world. Those spots are devoid of negative influences and contain only positive ones. As with a single person, so with the entire world. If you are murderous and kill living beings, then living beings will not have any good feelings toward you. If you are kind to living beings, then the living beings will be good to you. Thus, there is a definite connection between the human realm and the realm of animals. Time prohibits me from going into detail about this matter, 
from refraining from killing, liberating life and protecting the precepts. I could easily speak for three months on that topic alone. In fact, in three years, I couldn't exhaust the subject. But I won't say any more now and continue with the sutra text. Sutra, if each had it, then you, Ananda, would have two bodies. Commentary, if each had it, if you propose that both your hand and your head have the ability to make contact so that there is touch in both places, then you, Ananda, you would have two bodies. You would have two bodies because you would have two sensations of touch. Sutra, if there were only one touch in the head and the hand, then the hand and the head would be of one substance. If there were one substance, then no touch would be possible. Commentary, if there were only one touch in the head and in the hand, you proposed before that there were two powers of touch, one in the head and one in the hand. Now, you propose that there is only one power to touch, only one contact, not two, but then the hand and the head would be of one substance. They would be one if they were, there would be no sensation of contact. If they were one substance, then no touch would be possible. If there is only one touch in the head and the hand, now can touch be experienced? Do you see how this principle is being explained? Wonderful, so the ultimate point. Sutra, if there were two substances to which would the touch belong, the one which was capable of touch would not be the one that was touched. The one that was touched would not be the one that was capable of touch, nor should it be that the touch came into being between you and emptiness. Commentary, if there were two substances to which would the touch belong, the Buddha has just shown that a single substance cannot be said to experience touch. If then do you propose that the head and hand are two substances, making two kinds of touch in which one does the touch reside, the actual sensation of touch should lie in one of them. Which one is it? It is clear that one will be capable of touch and the other will be the thing touched. The one which was capable of touch would not be the one that was touched. The one that was touched would not be the one that was capable of touch. You cannot say that they are both capable of initiating the sensation of touch. For instance, I am not touching this table. Basically, the table hasn't any awareness, but my hand is the one that is capable of touch, while the table is the one that is touched. In the case of the hand and the head, though, which would be which? The one that was touched would not be the one capable of touch. The one that was capable of touch would not be the one that was touched. So then, which would you say touched which? Would the hand touch the head or would the head touch the hand? Speak up. Nor should it be that touch came into being between you and emptiness, since the empty space is basically nothing at all. Sutra, therefore you should know that neither the sensation of touch nor the body has a location, and so the two places of the body and touch are empty and false. Their origin is not in causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. Commentary, therefore you should know, because of the various principles that I have just explained, you ought to know that neither the sensation of touch nor the body, neither the existence of a reaction to touch nor the body has a location. The sensation of touch does not have a fixed place. You cannot say for certain what it is like. And so the two places of the body and touch, the place of the body and the place of touch are empty and false. They are not actual. Don't become attached to the objects of touch don't get attached and think. So and so is the fairest of the fair, and give rise to greed and attachment. It's empty and false. So what are you doing getting attached to it? Their origin is not in causes and conditions. The awareness of touch is not produced from causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously, nor are they 
spontaneously produced from within emptiness. They flow forth from the wonderful nature of true suchness of the first common treasury, but they are empty and false just the same. Don't become attached to them. You should return to your origin and return to your own treasury of the first common. Put down those false characteristics and return to your genuine basic nature. Sutra Ananda, your mind is always conditioned by three qualities, good, bad, and intermediate, inter, indeterminate, which produce patterns of dharmas. Commentary. Now I will explain the doctrine of how the mind creates conditions for the defining objects of dharmas. Ananda, your mind is always conditioned by three qualities. There are conditions continually in your mind. What is meant here is setting upon conditions. The most important thing that those who cultivate the way must avoid is to set upon conditions. Once the mind begins to set upon conditions, obstructions are created. The sixth consciousness, the mind consciousness, goes haywire and its whole outlook becomes caught up in setting upon conditions. Then it is not at all easy to cultivate the way. No matter how many good deeds you accomplish, they are all phony if you accomplish them with an attitude of setting upon conditions. It is also phony if you take living beings across, no matter how many with a mind that sets upon conditions. Ananda, in your mind, there are always conditions, good, bad, and indeterminate. The good refers to all wholesome dramas. The evil refers to unwholesome dramas. Indeterminate refers to that which is neither good nor bad. There exist these three natures which produce patterns of dramas. This refers to the ordinary reaction to the defining objects of dramas or to Buddha dharma. Patterns means that fixed patterns emerge among the defining objects of dramas. Sutra, are these dramas produced by the mind or do they have a special place apart from the mind? Commentary, would you say that the dramas that the mind creates conditions for are produced right there in the mind? Are these dramas produced by the mind or do they have a special place apart from the mind? The mind here is the sixth mind consciousness. Do they have a place apart from the sixth mind consciousness? Express your views on this. Speak up, Ananda. Now, Ananda does not trot the highs and fathom the depths. Ananda doesn't dare to guess at the state of the Buddha. He doesn't answer the Buddha's question. So the Buddha calls to him again to make sure that he is paying attention. If Ananda were doze off, dozing off, the Buddha would be speaking in vain, so he calls out to draw Ananda out of his dreams. Sutra, Ananda, if they were the mind, the dramas would not be its defining objects, since they would not be conditions of the mind. How could you say that they had a location? Commentary, Ananda, if they were in the mind, if you propose that, Dramas are simply produced from the mind that they the sixth mind consciousness. Then the dramas would not be as defining objects. Then the dramas your mind gives rise to would not be the defining objects of the mind. Since they would not be conditions of the mind, what your mind says is upon are the states of defining objects. However, according to your argument, these dramas are not defining objects in that case. Your mind would not be able to set upon them. Then, how could you say that they had a location? Since there would be no conditions for them in the mind, how could they have a location? So, the dramas of the mind, the drama the mind says is upon, have no location. Sutra, suppose they were to have a special place apart from the mind, then would the dramas themselves be able to know? Commentary. Suppose they would have a special place apart from the mind, they would be in another place. But if they were in another place, then would the dramas themselves be able to know? Is the nature of the dramas such that they know their dramas speak up? 
so try if they were to have a sense of knowing they would be called a mind if there was something other than you they would be someone else mind since they are not defining objects if they were the same as you they would be your own mind but how could your mind stand apart from you commentary if they were to have a sense of knowing they would be called a mind suppose they you say that they must know that they have a knowing awareness but that has knowing awareness is called the mind if there was something other than you they would be someone else mind since they are not defining objects something other than you means that they would be separated from you they would be apart from you but according to your argument they are not defining objects either because they have knowing awareness if they were apart from you and had knowing awareness they would be someone else mind if they were the same as you they would be your own mind perhaps you insist that what is apart from you and yet has knowing awareness is actually your mind but how could your mind stand apart from you if you explain it by saying that they are not someone else's mind but actually your own why aren't they one with you if they have knowledge then they are the mind but how can your mind and you be two different things sutra suppose they were to have no sense of knowing yet these defining objects are not forms sounds smells or tastes they are neither cold nor warmth not the characteristic of emptiness where would they be located commentary suppose they were to have no sense of knowing if you agree with the principle i have just explained i will say they do not know yet these defining objects are not forms sounds smells or tastes they differ from the realms of the five defining objects discussed above form sounds smells tastes and objects of touch what the buddha is discussing now are the dhammas defining objects which haven't any form nor any sound nor any smell nor any any taste they are neither cold nor warmth nor do they have the awareness of touch which knows separation unity cold and warmth nor the characteristic of emptiness nor do they have the characteristic of emptiness where would they be located then where would you say the dhammas reside this is what the buddha asks ananda but now ananda does not dare answer sutra we have established that they are represented in neither form nor emptiness nor is it likely that they exist somewhere in the human realm beyond emptiness for if they did the mind could not be aware of them when uh, then would they arise commentary that we have established that they are represented in neither form nor emptiness in the two kinds of defining objects of form and emptiness there is no representation of them nor is it likely that they exist somewhere in the human realm beyond emptiness it cannot be that the dhammas exist somewhere beyond emptiness for if they did the mind could not be aware of them since the mind is not the dhammas which it creates conditions for and then would they arise where where are dhammas established who established establishes them where would they arise Sutra. Therefore, you should know that neither dharmas nor the mind has a location, and so the two places of mind and dharmas are empty and false. Their origin is not in causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. Commentary. Therefore, because of this, Ananda, you should know that neither dharmas nor the mind has a location. Those two have no place that can be found either, and so the two places of mind and dhammas are empty and false. In the doctrine of the mind conditioning dhammas, both the places are empty and false. Their origin is not in causes and conditions, nor do their natures arise spontaneously. They are an illusory falseness which arises from within the nature of the treasury of the first common.